Um, hey, last night we were uh, talking about Bogart. Yeah. Who's a big part of the big part of the movie and a big part of the emotional landscape of the movie and the world of, that you're depicting and it was a big part of the world as I remember it. He'd been dead for, you know, a um, couple decades, but yeah. he was still a very, very living presence in yeah. a lot of different ways. Yeah. He, would you like to hear how he got into the movie? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I was telling him last night, so part of the movie or the character Dorothea is really based on my memories of my mom and pieces of my mom. And um, one thing she always used to say is, in my next life, I'm going to marry Humphrey Bogart. And so I recreated that in the film and sort of explored that a bit. And, and I just knew she always loved Bogey. And one way to understand my depression era, born in the 20s, kind of soft, butch-looking mother, is to think of her as Humphrey Bogart, which is actually as a... When I started therapy, I kind of figured that one out. And I was like, <laughs> wow, that explains mom so much. She's Bogart. I get it now, you know? It's confusing. But it makes a lot of sense. Um, so that idea and that theme was really um, part of how I understand her and really helped me write her. Um, um, my, I don't, I don't know how many people here know people born in the 20s. They don't like to talk about themselves and their inner lives or their secrets. And if you're born in the 60s, they, they came from a different culture. So I start trying to make a movie about my mom and I realize halfway through, like, crap, I don't really know her. <laughs> I, we're, we loved each other dearly, we're interwoven, I don't totally know her, how do I figure this out? Movies from the 30s and 40s um, taught me so much about her sense of humor, the subversiveness, the sarcasm, that was part that I grew up with. She was a very wily, um, funny, um, iconoclastic woman. Uh, really had a thriving anti-authoritarian issue, which was fun for me to be around. Um, and that's all very Bogart. It's very Bogart. And so whenever I was stuck, I would kind of say to myself, what would Bogart say right now? <laughs> and it would kind of work or be close. Or it, it just loosen it. It worked for me, put it that way. And it's not, obviously it's not literally Bogart, but it's Bogart as an object in my mind in this relationship. Um, <laughs> And so it did teach me something about my mom. Bogart is always playing underdogs who are, aren't going to win ultimately and are going to fail valiantly and who are going to make some great jokes along the way and will always help the weakest person in the room. And yeah, that was I knew that, but it was a different way of knowing it. Um. It's interesting what you're saying about the movies helping you to understand your mom because, I mean, that's been my experience as well. And, you know, a father who was in World War II who didn't want to talk about it, a mother who grew up during the Depression. And, but it helps to understand the parameters. You know, one movie at a time, you kind of, it's almost like um, placing something by radar. You're, you're you know, seeing uh, a lot of things crisscrossing and then pinpointing where certain emotional vectors come from and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's something that your movie really carries beautifully. I don't think I've ever seen it in a ah, film that's, before. That would be great. Yeah, well. <laughs> um, but, uh, how many people have seen 20th Century Women who are here today? Oh, that's so that's nice. That's pretty good. Yeah. But the rest of you who haven't, see it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to recreate it for you now. Um, um, the, I, uh, there's another movie, Stage Door. You know? Yeah, the with, Gregory LaCava. Uh, and with amazing, and uh, Ginger Rogers is funny, um, subversive woman. Yeah. Strong. Mm -hmm. You know, all the women in that movie, it's a, it's a, it's a movie about a, sort of a boarding house for actors who are all having down on their luck very mm -hmm. much, and it's very much depression culture. Yes. Vibes. And they are sort of kick around in this house and um, cut each other, wisecracking is what they would call yeah. it. And that... Um, that like going to this sort of these like very witty put downs or very witty um, I, I see the real situation here um, lines um, became a big part of the Dorothea character and you see it in film after film it's in all the Thin Man all the um, so many William Powell performances um, 
And yeah, I was watching the movie last night and you know, on the big screen and it was like, I really smell 30s and 40s films mm -hmm. watching it more than I ever did. Mm -hmm. Smell 30s and 40s. I've, I feel the presence of the 30s and 40s yes. uh, influence on my movie more than ever just by seeing it big like you're supposed to. Uh -huh. you know? Yeah, but also the influence on the characters too. Yeah. 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 Stage door also. Lucille Ball was part of that. So great. Yeah. Really young Lucille Ball. Yeah. Um, so you, you took, did you take your time writing this film? <laughs> um, Having started in 2011, I, apparently I did. It yeah. seems to be too. Yeah. <laughs> it appears to be 2016. Yeah. Now, so. See, this is horrible. Yeah. Yeah. There's another reality where I make a movie every three years, and I'm on my sixth film, and we're talking about that. <laughs> and that's that's so great. Yeah. That, that happened. Because <laughs> if I only made three movies and they take five years each, that would be so depressing. Because <laughs> I love shooting and I adore making movies, and how could you bear waiting five, six years? Well, but what's, that's time well spent, I'm assuming, because you're waiting for things to. I, I guess my process. So I went to gel. art school. Yeah. Yeah. Waiting is a nice word for it. Um, mm -hmm. So I went to art school, didn't go to film school, didn't come into writing in any normal way, never, wasn't a good student in that way. And, but. It's kind of an all-around failure, huh? <laughs> yeah, and uh, but charming, <laughs> really charming. Um, you turned out beautifully, <laughs> in a way, though. Um, and uh, the way I approach writing, I, I think of directing as writer directing. This is somehow how I think of directing. So I got into writing because I had to be a writer director. So I got into it in a very weird way. And then with these last two films, because I found this desire to sort of report on things I knew, write things that are reserved, and also where there was a very thick personal connection of love or grief or unresolved stuff. And that thought, okay, that's an energy that I'm gonna tap and try to make shareable. Um, so anyways, I write in a very weird process. I start with just like nuggets of memories and five by seven cards and it's more like an art practice, I think, than like a writer practice. I'm just collecting things, I'm collecting the Jimmy Carter speech, I'm collecting images, I'm collecting music, and I don't know exactly what it is, and I've read a little too many Fellini interviews about how he works like that, you know, and sort of you gotta sneak up on your new script like a lover and, you know, not like pounce on it, and and uh, and then Milan Kundera is a big influence on me in the way he talks about a novel, and that, you know, your structure of your novel should be something that's, you know, unique for you and unadvisable to anybody else and not a formula but a meditation and an exploration. Yeah. So I'm trying to do that. And so then, yeah, you can just, and I'm really curious and I love Wikipedia. <laughs> I love, like, yeah, Planned Parenthood, how'd that happen? Okay, Margaret Sanger, let's just follow every detail of that. And that's in my script for like six months, like a whole two pages of the Planned Parenthood. And um, things like that happen. So I go down lots of rabbit holes. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, the first year is pretty fun. The next two years are a little hellish. I have to say that it, this is, you know, just to, to give it some context, I, um, I don't think that there's an, a director that I know that doesn't feel that way. I don't know yeah. what I'm doing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, something I've heard Marty Scorsese say before yeah, he starts yeah. making a movie. It's just like, yeah, got to start all over again, start from scratch. Yeah. I think writing, especially, directing comes so naturally to me, and I feel so lucky I get to do it, and like mm -hmm. on set directing. Um, and that is just like so, uh, you're just so alive, and things are happening, and you're with people, and there's consequences, and things manifest and you see what you did wrong and you adjust and it's like very um, a ship in a storm, yeah. right? Writing is the solo journey into the desert of your failures, you know? Uh, because like when you're writing, you write nine tenths bad stuff and you keep the one tenth, you know? And then you write nine more bad things and one more good thing. Okay, now I got two good things, you know? But it, it's, you have to spend so much time in um, things that you didn't do well, things that aren't what you hoped for, and that's just part of the deal, it seems like. And when you're casting, you're looking for something that's gonna surprise you and bring more to life than what you had on the page. And yeah, well, it's, I'm so, 
especially with these last two films, because they're coming from such a personal place and they're really rooted in memory and these real people, the last thing I want to do is sort of like a self-absorbed memoir thing or be like too personal or like fail because it's personal. That would be like the worst failure ever twice again, you know? So I'm always like, it's got to... Whoever I pick, it's theirs. You know, it's their authorship. It's they have to make it real and alive for themselves, and it's like um, I have to give them the keys to the car, right? Yes. And that's all I'm trying to do is give them the keys to the car. Mm -hmm. So casting is everything, and it's with the idea that they whatever I write, it, it's less than half of the job, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's I guess it's everything because it's the landscape, but they have to. Not just be good actors, but it has to stir the pot of their being somehow. Mm -hmm. And then when that happens, I think that's what people respond to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you went to art school, as you say, and you were, you know, you're a visual artist. And how did you find your way to movies? Did you have, did you grow up with a desire to make movies? Movies seem like going to the moon. Right. It's know? something that somebody else did. Yeah, yeah. I'm big and crazy and hard and yeah. and Hollywood and I didn't have like a super um, relationship to it. I went to Cooper Union they had like a Friday night film class or you know the free film on Friday night at your art school kind yeah. of thing yeah. and and making this movie I made me realize that that's where I saw Eight and a Half and that's where I saw Truffaut and that's where I saw Amacord and all these movies that like are central to this movie to yeah. me I can remember seeing them and being just like Eight and a Half had such a huge impression on me mm -hmm. Um, uh, seeing a movie like that when you're 18, um, yeah. it just blew everything open. I didn't know I wanted to be a filmmaker, but it influenced the other stuff I was doing. Yes. Right? Um, but I was um, on my way to being a good... Uh, I studied with Hans Hacke yep. at, at Cooper Union, and he's a conceptual artist, and it was in the 80s, and it was a very um, socially engaged, sort of politicized time to be trying to work in an art context. And all of us kind of agreed that, like, fuck the art world, you know, we're like, we're going to work in design or anything in the public sphere, the art world is too exclusive and too codified and we have to find some way out. So I got into doing design, but it was always, I was an incredibly pretentious designer because I was trying to make art, you know, like I was, I wasn't just doing a job, I was trying to like, yeah. I'm a Hans Hacke student as a designer, <laughs> I'm posing as a designer, right. you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, that's just the truth, folks. Um, and so... I got into doing record covers, all that kind of stuff, and I just I knew I wanted to work in the public sphere. And I used to use that word a lot. The public sphere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> so <laughs> can you imagine? Don't be I'm twenty-five. It's okay. and it's mom, about it. <laughs> speaking of mom and pop, how's art school and how's life after art school? You know, mom, dad, it's not the public sphere. <laughs> So there you have it, and uh, <laughs> and then and I I really love documentary film. I took some documentary film classes, and I think the two things that happened were one I saw Thin Blue Line, and the Thin Blue Line by Earl Morris. Line by yeah. Morris. And I don't know if, has anybody seen that? Great, that's so awesome. It's such a beautiful movie, and mm -hmm. the structure of it, and the diagrammatic part of it, and yes. all the recreations, yep. and the sort of meta ness of it. Mm -hmm. I was like, whoa, you know, I was like, I want to do that. Uh, mm. We're showing his new movie tonight across the street, yeah. by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then also like Charles and Ray Eames, their films. They're, they do short films and very educational films. And, yep. um, they're Powers very, of Ten. Powers of Ten. And just simple. They also do films like Washing Asphalt, yep. you know? So someone who knows about like minimalist 70s art, Washing Asphalt as a movie for kids is like, oh, this is really interesting space. It's not art. It's better. It's more thick and invested in a design as a job slot. Yeah. So those two things. And then, you know, I was unemployed walking around the Lower East Side a lot in the 90s, and you see Jim Jarmusch cruising by, you know? And me and we're just, me and my roommate are just sort of waiting for life to happen or a job or whatever and going to yeah. the New York Public Library because yeah. it's got air conditioning kind of life. <laughs> and and we're like, fuck, we're just like in, in a Jim Jarmusch movie that's not actually being filmed, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we used to joke about that all the time and I think yeah. it actually just kind of like why don't I just make a Jim Jarmusch film um, and Jim Jarmusch his um, you know just those like Down by Law 
the way that the acting was, the way that the production level was, uh, it was just so much more accessible mm -hmm. to me. It was like, I can maybe do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I can't do Casablanca, but maybe I could do that. Yeah. And then his, his framing and his shooting, I didn't know, he taught me that I liked Ozu, you know? Yes. Um, the staticness and the proscenium and the quietness and the slow pacing. That just really speaks to my, my like I love sati, right? And I feel like my brain kind of runs on an Eric Satie pace. Mm -hmm. And um, he's like that to me, too. Yes, His yes. early films, and it was like a, just yeah. a real inviting relief. And, um, and it was another thing that made me feel like, well, maybe I could do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It feels closer to the ground than the vast apparatus of Hollywood with all of the... Yeah marketing stuff around it and even yeah. like the immersiveness of a typical hollywood film yeah and the verisimilitude yeah like he's sort of he's something else yeah. yeah yeah there's a simplicity and a do-it-yourself side to it yeah right yeah so when you were there ready to make your first film yeah film sucker how yeah. did you your first feature yeah film sucker yeah um, how did you go about the job <laughs> <laughs> In which part of it? Like, I adapted the book from Walter Kern's yes. novel, um, and that was quite an experience. I, you know, I really, um, uh, in at, at Cooper, I got, I got interested in history and literature and all that, but it was in art school, mm -hmm. you know? So it was kind of hard to do it. <laughs> and so I wasn't really like a master at it in yeah. any, by any, and more curious than capable, yeah. right? Uh, that's going on my tombstone. Um, more, cur more curious than capable. <laughs> um, with a positive lilt to it. Um, uh, so it was a huge, ex it was huge learning experience for me for to try to write a dramatic thing, a thing, uh, a, a script with dramatic um, formulas or following um, something that we we're going to have like a cathartic connection to a character where transformation is going to happen, all the things that happen, happen in normal scripts. Yep. So in a weird way, it was like my graduate school, and we did it with, um, it was the good machine which turned into this is that. Mm -hmm. So that's like Anthony Bregman, Ted Hope, and Ann Carey, and Ann Carey worked on this film. So and there, I learned a lot mm -hmm. from them, and also just about the biz. I feel like Thumbsucker for me was just a punishing way to learn about the film world. Why punishing? It was hard. I don't. I didn't know how to do it. Not not be a director, but the, making a movie is a little bit like running for mayor of a small city. <laughs> you have to get money. You got to get all these different people. Yeah. It is sort of a political, social right. You event. Meet a lot Your of skill set is not just like what lens and all mm -hmm. that. Your right. skill set is like an entrepreneur starting a startup. Yeah. Dealing with the inner workings of the film community yes and so um and i learned that i adore actors on yeah. that movie mm -hmm. and i had really great actors and i, I adore um helping performance mm -hmm. uh and that's kind of what i came out of that with and you know your first movie you just learn like what it feels like to get hit by a baseball bat in different ways uh and how to endure <laughs> that <laughs> now when you say <laughs> <laughs> when you say helping performance, what, uh -huh. the, what does that, what, um, what's like, the task? Uh, it's a, some, so um, I think what actors do is like um, really magical and beautiful and I'm sort of like a formerly very shy person and I can't be unselfconscious when, I'm, when it counts, you know. So I can't do what they do at all. But maybe that makes me really ad admiring and sort of like, oh my God, how can I help you? I think that's my basic vibe as a director. <laughs> oh my God, thank you so much for doing this. How can I help you? <laughs> and it's a pretty good one because it makes, the, it, it, it's disarming. And the, the actors were like, well, okay, let's yeah. try to work this out. Uh -huh. um, so some things I learned from some other people that I did on that movie was gotta have two weeks of rehearsal, but your rehearsal isn't doing the script. It's doing everything that came before that story. So if you have a family, you do experiential um, uh, improv improvising things. You do like, everyone go to a room, you're asleep, wake up in the morning, have breakfast. Yeah. Go, you know. And they just literally do that and just sort of build some tissue. Um, so for Thumbsucker, I did a 
me and uh, Anne were remembering this. We did a, I made it so that uh, Tilda Swinton's the, playing the mother and yeah. Lou Pucci's the son in the movie. So I made them switch roles. So Tilda Swinton is a child or a teenager who still sucks her thumb and Lou Pucci is the parent trying to deal with this. Yeah. And I played the shaming uh, school doctor type person that was busting the mom about the behavior of the, the kid. Yeah. And we did different variations of that. Yeah. And it's just a way to experience, so for Tilda to experience um, what the what her partner was experiencing. Yes. And so it, it, very weird games like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really fun to try to get Christopher Plummer to do that. <laughs> 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 He's like, uh, first thing I did with them was, um, so I have Christopher and Ewan in my next movie. And, and, in, in and beginners. luckily, yeah. in Beginners, and Christopher's playing a character based on my father who came out of the closet when he was 75, and Ewan's kind of me. Not as good looking, but. So, as you. Yeah, right? as yeah. Me. yeah. You and McGregor is just a little <laughs> less, yeah. <clears throat> Wanted to be humble. Um, so the first thing I asked them to do, we're at the Plaza Hotel where Mr. Palmer has to stay all the time, and or in the Beverly Hills Hotel, excuse me. Yep. And I said, okay, you're going to go off without me, and you and you take care of Christopher. You're going to go to Barney's. Here's $250. Christopher, buy yourself like a scarf or something. Now you're gay. And buy yourself something that's like the beginning of that uh -huh. for you. Yeah. Uh, on the way there, Christopher gets really interested in Ewan's skinny jeans. Like, what are those? And you know, <laughs> Ewan's like, oh, they're just skinny jeans, you know? And, oh, skinny jeans. And uh, they cruise into um, <laughs> Barney's, and, and Ewan, who's just a dear soul, is like, Christopher, there's the scars Mike wanted. And Chris, oh, fuck that. Where are the jeans, you know? <laughs> and uh, goes, Try for like two, and I said, just go for like an hour and come back, and we'll two or three hours trying on jeans. <laughs> Buys like eight pairs. He doesn't. Christopher Plummer doesn't carry money on him, you know, because he's, he's Christopher Plummer. So yeah. they went through my two hundred fifty bucks. Ewan's got to pay all the money himself. He's <laughs> desperately trying to get Christopher back to yeah. the me, you know. Yeah. And so when they arrive back, Ewan's just sweating, kind of like, I'm sorry, Mike, and and Christopher's just strolling in, and I was like. Wow, that works so good. That is so me yeah. and my dad. I don't. I, <laughs> I didn't know it was gonna work that well. Um, but I try to d create situations where the actors are gonna feel and experience what the I, what the characters are mm -hmm. feeling and experiencing, and mm -hmm. have develop experiential muscle memory. Yeah, and somebody like Christopher Walken, who's a pro and who's been around for many, many years, and he's probably on the lookout for like, oh, I've seen it all. Yeah. Yeah, but. You know, so for him, it's different for, than it is for you and McGregor. Yeah, and Ewan's just like game for anything. And yeah. Just, yeah, Ewan's just such a great open person. So, so they come back, and Chris is just sort of like entertaining me. Yeah. He's very polite. He's, very, he's really sweet to me. Don't yeah. mean to, and he that he endured me at all is really a testament to his openness. Yeah. Because you know, at that age, and as much as he done, and I'm coming with these kind of weird things, and he would sort of like. <laughs> so like they come home from that and I'm like okay I've messed up the bed and now I need um, you and you need to make the Christopher's bed for him and then you're going to order him lunch and make sure he gets lunch and everything cause yeah. I did a lot of stuff for that for my dad as he was uh, dying was like, yeah. and, and Christopher, Christopher goes you know Michael not every director needs to do this <laughs> and uh, and luckily Ewan was in my eye line. Ewan was right behind Christopher, and Ewan just sort of like went like that. And I was like, "Oh, I'm sorry, Christopher. This is how I work, you know." <laughs> and but I needed Ewan's support to help me do that. And then Christopher went along and did everything. Yeah. So like that, and that he did everything and tried. Um, I, I hope I'm like that when I'm his age and haven't done as much stuff as he's done. You know, yeah. like he's just. It was really impressive. And was your writing on beginners as lengthy as the yeah. writing of 20th Century Women? Yeah. <sighs> Let's pray to the gods that it isn't next time. But yeah, it's like a two, three year-ish thing. Mm -hmm. And some, so to be honest, I think on beginners it was a little different. It was maybe like two years, like early into the second year. Mm -hmm. I started showing it to people and I started trying to get... Um, 
casting or the beginnings of, of financing. Mm -hmm. And I went through like a year and a half of, and this was around a nice year called like 2007, you know, like with a cool oh, yeah. financial yeah, situation happening. Yeah. And so it was like, you know, it's a sort of like a tour of no's, you know, like, yeah. You know? Uh -huh. And in the tour of no's, you do learn a lot. You get a lot of notes or you get a lot of like, when everybody's passing on your thing that they don't want to finance it. So um, I had a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And I wrote and wrote during that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this time it was different. I had It took me forever to write the script. And my dear, sweet boy was born mm -hmm. right in the middle of it. And that really changed my life happily, yeah. you know. Um, but this time I just, I had the luck to have just sent it to one person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in the interim, it's become... Uh a little bit more difficult to get ambitious movies made, huh? W do you think that that's correct? From which one? What do you mean? <laughs> Between beginners and 20th century women. Well, I had such a lucky... I, my personal experience is really different because... Yeah. Like, I... Because Beginners... Beginners was no huge success, but it was good enough that I got Megan Ellison's intention. Yes. And... Um, and... And I'm, I'm friends with Spike Jones, and he did work with her, and he raved about her. So I just knew that, like, yeah. that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm not even gonna tell my agents, and I'm just gonna email her my script and see what happens. Yeah. You know. And luckily, she really responded to that mm -hmm. kind of process. Yeah. No, I mean she's it's incredible what she's done. You know. Yeah. And, and the whole and company. Her. She started a real beautiful place that just operates differently and for different reasons and they're filled with smart people and yeah. Chelsea Bernard uh, was huge for me in making this movie in a way I don't know if I've experienced before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask you when you're collecting material for your films, when at a certain point do you start having getting visual ideas for where for instance, the actors are in the frame, things like that, certain images that you or like, wanna... Like, um, like for this, I was like, I, I, I collect a lot of Stephen Shore stuff, uh -huh. you know, Stephen Shore, the photographer, because he's shooting a lot right in my period. Yes. So I was also just to learn, like, which cars are there and what mm -hmm. does it look like? And um, But the mm -hmm. way that Stephen Shore's, you know, the fine-grain, large-format thing makes it look so contemporary. Mm -hmm. There's nothing nostalgic and it's very clean. So that was something that influenced in, that, in the film a bit. You know, mm -hmm. that was something me and Sean talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm sure I'm collecting that, and that helps me. Um, music helps me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously in this film, because this film is partly about music yeah. and what music does to you yeah. and how you can help find yourself with music. Um, I collect lots of... Th so at the beginning for me, the first year, the idea is like, don't be too judgmental at all. Be wildly unjudgmental and believe in the unconscious and anything that sort of just gets your attention, put it into the bucket, you know? And the bucket sometimes is writing these cards, sometimes it's just a file on my laptop where it could be an image or a movie or this and that. And I kind of knew Fellini just started coming to me. And I haven't thought yeah. about Fellini in a while. You know, yeah. I, mean, I'm, I love Fellini, but I haven't really, like, Fellini's a hard one to be influenced by because he's like a total yeah. maestro. Mm -hmm. And like, only a fool would do that. <laughs> but he just kept coming to me, and he's such a generous spirit. Um, if you ever read Fellini's interviews, uh, he's so generous as a just a human, you know, like yeah. about the weirdness of individuals, and he's so pro the individual spirit, and he's so um, forgiving to all the wobbles of being a director, yeah. and that you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's part of it. And mm -hmm. and then eight and a half came to me a lot, and Amicord. And mm. Amicord, I wouldn't think to me is like my favorite Fellini movie, but it just kind of kept, like, sometimes these things kind of knock on your door mm -hmm. more than you knock on their door. Mm -hmm. And I feel like 20th Century Woman is a big debt to Amicord mm -hmm. with the multiple narrators and the kind of the setting and this kind of relational group portrait mm -hmm. thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. And the effort to really nail the time that it's, you know, to and, really Yeah, and sort of being like a love letter to this place that he grew up in. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting that you 
mentioned Fellini and Jim Jarmusch because the other night Jim was here yeah. and, and he was talking at length about Fellini yeah. and riding around Rome with him and Jim, you must, you know, he was, he, he had a, some nice advice he for wrote, him. He rode around with Fellini? He did. Oh. Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't, he, did, <laughs> he didn't want to brag, Cranky. you know, but he was just yeah. talking about it. It just kind of yeah, came up. So. Yeah. <laughs> Through, through, so Annette Bennings in my film, right? And every <laughs> once in a while I get to like, she's married to Warren Beatty, yeah. who directed this movie called Reds, which is like, yeah. to me it's like one of the yeah. best movies ever. Yeah. And Warren will be yeah, like... He made some good movies, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Just a legend. Yeah. And so Warren will say something like, yeah, did I tell you how Kubrick helped me with Reds? And then he'll walk away <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, who could tell you, like... <laughs> it's not in a book. He's going to tell you a story that <laughs> happened to him. And uh, now, the, the other so day, so finish the Fellini thing. Sorry. No, there's nothing. <laughs> sorry, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but his interview. The, you know, there's a book. Uh, they always have the color on the top. I forgot who publishes those. And there's the, director the, collections. It's the University of, of uh, Mississippi. Yeah. Perhaps. That it, yeah. Am I wrong? I don't know, but it, it's the inter interviews with directors. Yeah, it's actually hard to get now. Um, this the the Fellini one, but I would recommend it if you're a filmmaker at all. But also just as a human, he's so articulate and generous, and like gifted at that. Um, it's like my bedside Xanax. You know, <laughs> I read it. I read a little bit all the time. I'll just like one page. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. And. Um. You mentioned um, Annette Benning just now, and uh, during the press conference the other day, you, you said to the audience, hey, you guys should all make a movie about your moms with great actresses. You know? uh -huh. um, and and uh, it's amazing what the two of you found together in this film. I, I, I think it's quite remarkable. She's, uh, you know, she's, she, doesn't, she hasn't appeared in that many movies in the last few years, and um, she's just right there in the sinew of the movie. Yeah, it was real like aligning of a lot of stars because she's exactly the right age. And a woman of that caliber and that age who looks beautifully natural is really hard to find. Yes, it is. And who's so like just ready to be like that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then the intel her intelligence and her like, her like, not just that she's able to display a lot of complexity, right? Yeah. But she's totally comfortable with it. Yes. And kind of not always pleasing you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's brave mm -hmm. and really interesting to my, this character, that's so my mom, you know? Yeah. And so that was really essential. And then her sort of, it sounds reductive to call it her androgyny, but Annette is, has a really interesting balance or mm -hmm. flow between points, I feel like, mm -hmm. on the male-female scale. And that was really crucial. Mm -hmm. And then it was really interesting working with her. I talked to her a lot about my mom. She liked hearing it. I always tell her, just, I'll tell you stories or whatever, but use what you want. Don't, it's not precious. We need to change anything. That's, we'll change it, anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and she's just very curious. And, but she's like a cat. She just kind of listens and she's, you know, and she's, she, she's generous, but she's like, and like, and so what do you think of that? I'm thinking about it, you know? <laughs> or she, she would tell a story or something like that, but, and I kind of slowly <laughs> caught on to like, okay, it's a very private process for you, for you uh -huh. in some ways. And she's really generous to other actors, and it's not a big deal, but it's like, right, you are cooking on something inside yourself, and I, being the director, like, how can I help you? You know, uh, for her, it's like, right, just be a little quiet and back off. Um, <laughs> and and, you're, and you're, you're working on something very deep and, and very personal yeah. and intimate. Mm -hmm. So you do need to sort of like let, them let that person have their space. And actors usually, when there was a director they're like me, how can I help you? They're like, oh, come on in, you know? And I'm used <laughs> to having this like really juicy back and forth. So yeah. it was a really interesting process. Like, okay, that's what you need. And then when we started doing rehearsals and when we started getting into it, it was like, wow. Um, it's amazing. Um, the thing that's amazing about her, yeah. so much training, so much theatrical training, yeah. so much experience, you kind of think that she's going to have a plan. Or, or you know, actors like that often work out every beat of a scene or every beat of a page. Mm -hmm. 
and have sort of a worked out thing. Annette has worked out the psychology of the character. She's worked out the emotional core of the character. But on each take, she just like throws the ball. She just goes for freedom and mm -hmm. intuition and like um, it's it was quite beautiful to watch and surprising and my favorite kind of acting. So you get something different with every take. Well, it, it, she's completely in control if she wants to be. Yeah. And if I say something, she just you know, one inch to the left, she'd be like, you know, she's yeah. completely in control. But what she desires is freedom, and what she desires is be su is surprised mm -hmm. in the mo and just to be truly in the moment with the other person mm -hmm. and following the nuances of that moment and. Mm -hmm. And um, that is an incredible, uh, it's not just like a talent. It's like, it's like, okay, you are, you know, you're like a magical creature. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do that. Yep. Yeah. The, um, th for those of you who haven't seen it, the ensemble in this film is, is incredible. And I mean, you know, we could talk about so many people. I just want to say that I, I, I knew so many people like Billy Crudup's character when I was growing yeah. up. Yeah, me too. Um, he's, yeah. Ab he's always great, and he's especially great in this movie, but these guys who are kind of grounded and kind of not, and kind of drifting, and kind of happy, and kind of sad. Um, yeah. yeah. And Santa Barbara especially, uh -huh. a lot of them, and sort of like warm honey. Too, yeah. Like they're, yeah. Uh, the yeah. interesting thing to do, in the, kind of slowly grew this realization in the writing, and then especially with Billy, was, okay, it's 20th century woman, sort of a portrait of these women. The women are the lead. Billy's a supporting character, and Billy actually is doing the function that often a pretty woman does in a movie with men leads. That's he's right. He's kind of the sex object. And he's, um, and he's very, and it, that happened in the 70s with men a lot. Yeah. I knew a lot of men who were like, didn't have it quite all together, but they were a great sex object. To, to women, and that floated them through a lot of life, mm -hmm. but then you get to a certain age, and, the, and it's that you get to the end of that rope. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And um, me and Billy talked about that a lot, and he really, it was very vivid for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, but it was really interesting, and in the editing, we're like, right, Billy's like the girl washing the car in the short jeans. Right. You know? Um, <laughs> There's a lot of inversions like that. <laughs> yeah, my mom's Bogart, Billy's a hot girl, you know. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to talk about when you get to the stage of working with your DP and your production designer, and um, particularly on this movie, the, the, the half-built house is a thing of beauty. Yeah, that house mm -hmm. is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, well, we lucked into that house. So the production design, especially on something like this, mm. I don't have a ton of money. Yep. You have to be really, uh, every, like if there's a chair that you don't have to rent, don't rent it, you know? It's like down to the chairs yeah. and down to the like how many props. Mm -hmm. And so since these movies are based on sort of, they come from my family, a truck pulls up to my house and we just dump in all my parents' furniture <laughs> and like that's my mom's bedspread that mm -hmm. she's laying on and that's all, all my chairs in the movie and then all our rugs and all that stuff. And it, so that kind of becomes the core. And um, Chris Jones, who was our production designer, was really good at like being accepting that and then just growing it from mm -hmm. there. And the 70s that we were trying to create wasn't sort of a kitschy 70s. Yeah. And Chris is so good at, we did a lot of research and we found this one beautiful set of photographs that are actually houses in Brooklyn. But it was just about the interiors. And you would learn how... Um, eclectic the 70s were and and taught us a lot about like class in the 70s and I think you know if you think about the thing that I learned a lot was right in the 70s the middle class and working class culture life had a lot more power it was more vibrant and it had a lot more aesthetic power and like if you're wealthier you, did, you didn't want to show your money yeah and a, a more lower middle working class thing had more cred, had more, had, had more, it was, it had power and strength. Yes. So true. you wanted that in your house. Yeah. And, and, and things were just rougher. Yep. And, and more eclectic and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it, it really helped us sort of figure out a, an understanding of class at that time and how that is manifested in plants and chairs and 
napkins. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with Sean Porter, our DP, um, we had a pretty intuitive process. I found that house real quick, so we knew that was going to be the heart of the movie. So we just started walking around it and taking pictures, and ch both of us walking around cameras and sort of taking pictures and showing us our pictures and kind of picking the ones that we liked, and it kind of mm. slowly worked into this language of how we were going to do it. Yeah. And then we're two, you know, white boy, sort of Protestant natured white boys and we'd always think we need to get a little Italian here we need to get a little Roman Italian-ness <laughs> and like loosen up and be juicier and yeah. a little and Fellini get a little right? Fellini yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, so that's how the Dolly track became such a big part of our life mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we would joke to each other like he was oh let's put the camera here and that I was like that's yeah. a little Protestant you know <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, and I'm really I have deep <laughs> Protestant vibes somehow. I don't know. Like I want it, the Ozu thing. I want to keep it at a distance. Camera fixed. You're yeah. over there. We're over here. Uh -huh. And this movie, we're like, yeah. no, let's like push in all the time. Let's get in with the people. Mm -hmm. What are you giving him for visual references? You mentioned some photographs, but did you, I get the idea that maybe you don't look at contemporary films. That that's not. Yeah, I know. Sean told me that. So mm -hmm. what do we? Um, and so we. We watched a lot of, of Eight and a Half for the blocking and the yes. way he does coverage. It's so amazing, and the camera moves he does are so strange. You know, you'll track yeah. in on this side of the line, then someone goes on, you go yeah. over there, and there, these compound moves, you're tracking, and the yeah. camera's panning the other direction. Yeah, and he picks up faces, and then it becomes hypnotic. Face to face, body yeah. to body. It's yeah. so amazing and masterful. Yeah. So I'm not trying to do as elaborate stuff as yes. but it'd be inflected by that a little bit. Um, we watched a lot of that. We watched um, um, uh, Jane Campion. Her coverage is so interesting in Bright Star. Mm -hmm. And Bright Star influenced beginners a little bit, just in the lighting, you know, yeah. and in the way that it feels so unlit. and An extremely underrated movie. It's such a great yeah. movie, right? Yeah. I love Bright yeah. Star. Great and, movie. Um, and the framing and the, the, the coverage is mm -hmm. very particular and unusual. So that was a big influence. Yeah. Um, we talked about um, a woman is a woman a lot. The white walls inside that place I just, mm -hmm. and the cleanness of it. And uh, again, the camera's moving a lot inside mm -hmm. an interior space in there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we had all these black and white films and we'd be like, wait, but our movie's in color. You know? <laughs> <laughs> or at one point, Sean goes, <clears throat> But Mike, all your movies are 50 years ago, and they're not. Oh God, they are. You know, like, <laughs> like yeah. And are you shooting on um, Alexa? Alexa, Alexa. Yeah. yeah. And you had shot beginners uh, on Alexa. On Alexa. On a, oh, no, on the red. So, so I did my first movie, Thumbsucker, on on um, on uh, uh, two three five on uh, God. Is it Super 16 or 35? It's 35, mm -hmm. and it's even more. It's anamorphic. Yep. And that was brutal. Anamorph, you guys all know what anamorphic is, right? Okay. And the depth of field. For the benefit of someone yeah. who just said that they didn't. And it's so really anamorphic, uh, it's a different kind of lens um, system and it's older and it, the key thing that you need to know about it, and it has incredibly low depth of field, which makes for very beautiful images. But if someone's moving like this, it's a big problem. <laughs> mm. And if you have Vincent D'Onofrio in your movie, who's like, <laughs> we, we literally ended up that the AC would put tape on his shoulder sometimes if his mm. shoulder was out of the shot just to get focus marks. And, um, but also through like, the aspect ratio is 2.35 to 1, so it's much, much wider than it's high. And so you cinematic. have to squeeze it. It's squeezed, and then when it's projected, the anamorphic ones, you know, yeah. unsqueeze. And like uh, all your flares and out of focus lights are all an ellipse instead of a circle. And you're limited in the number of lenses you can use. Right? Yeah, yeah, and especially if you don't have a lot of money, you get all the junky ones. And right. Oh, the lens yeah. you use all the time, the upper right quadrant is out of focus. Okay, great. Let's make a movie. <laughs> um, um, so anyways, with the problem with film, for me, I'm making movies I don't have a lot of money. Uh, you're shooting film, you have great actors, and you're counting your film, and you're like, hmm, you know, you've already shot 2,000 feet. Um, for the next thing, you might right. not want to shoot that much. At lunch, you're, you're counting your film, how much I got. And, it, and it, I remember just like with 
can you imagine having Tilda someone in your hands and going, I'm only going to do four takes because I'm counting film and I knew I have these yeah. other scenes. So I, and then um, I met Miranda July at, the, we, our films came out at the same time in Sundance and we were sort of on tour together. Me and you and everyone together. I know. Right? Me and you and yeah. everyone we know, my film Thumbsucker. And her film just kicked my ass and my film's ass in numerous competitions and we were, we were starting our love affair. And, and everyone come up in her film was shot on video or on digital. And everyone's like, oh, your film's so beautiful and great. And no one, no one said squat about my anamorphic. <laughs> and I was, so I was somewhere in Sweden at the film festival. I was like, never doing that again. Yeah, you know? yeah. And it made it hard. So anyways, and you know, Beginners was made for like $3 million, Union, LA. And I like to have days, right? So I'm shooting 30. We only did 32 days on that. But if you're going to do 32 days, Union, in LA, you're not doing film. Right. And I love turning on the camera and not turning it off. Yeah. Um, and I, it does a great thing. You turn on the camera, you give direction, you're talking, you do the normal. I don't like saying, I don't like slating. I don't like saying ready in action or just say, is the camera rolling? Good. Mm -hmm. And I'll still direct. And it, it disarms the actors. Um, or I'll, sometimes I'll do it slightly showily. Like Ang Lee taught me this trick. Um, Roll camera, great, everyone ready. Oh, wait, hang on. And I'll walk in and I'll give a long direction. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then maybe have a sip of my coffee and then I'll wander off. Yeah. And everyone's kind of like, okay. <laughs> <Do> <laughs> <start>. <laughs> um, it just diffuses the scene. So yeah. often, you know, roll sound, roll camera, it gets everyone like, <gasps> yeah. like this. Yeah. yeah. Concentrate. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So you're trying to, and then I'll do, I love doing takes and sequence. So while the camera's on, we'll do, four takes in a row without mm -hmm. turning the camera off. Mm -hmm. So hair and makeup can't jump in and the, the sort of the heat stays on the, on, the, on the food the whole time. You know what I mean? <laughs> that you keep cooking. <clears throat> yeah. Do you keep, do you sometimes get things that people don't know that they're, that if they don't know that the camera's rolling? Well, I don't do that so much because that's yeah. kind of, uh, especially actors of the, of the experience level that I'm dealing yeah. with. When you're dealing with non-actors or you mm -hmm. do that a lot and mm -hmm. they're, they're not, Offended. Yeah, it's it's not kind of it's sneaking up on someone. Right. Uh, I'll, like um, I I rarely say cut or I'll say cut real late. Yeah, or I'll, I'll kind of like make a gesture like okay great, but I didn't say cut. And then yeah. AC is waiting for a cut, right? Mm -hmm. And so I know the camera's still rolling, mm -hmm. and but everyone's sort of like we're mm -hmm. done, mm -hmm. you know. And Christopher caught onto that. And Christopher was like end cut. Because <laughs> <laughs> he comes from a theatrical experience and he's so focused on the audience mm -hmm. and so thinking about the audience, even in a film situation. Yeah. And it was really amazing to watch him. You know, he would, like, um, there's a great scene where he's wearing his oxygen cannula and he tells the, tells the son um, that the mom asked him to get married yeah. and it's kind of like a long scene and it's like I just want to shoot one angle on you and one on you and that's all we're mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. so he didn't know that before mm -hmm. and then he, so he knew that okay that's the angle and he did this and he has a long kind of page and a half two page thing which for me is long and he starts over here away from the camera certain point you see a little bit more of him and then he comes he, he turned it into like three acts mm -hmm. and I noticed he does that a lot like he'll figure out how to create a story within one camera angle. He gives a scene an arc. Yeah, and, and just, he's very hyper aware of keeping you all happy. Yes. You know, and yeah. engaged. He's a storyteller. Yes. You know? Um, so he doesn't like it when the storytelling tension has been turned off. Right. You know? Right. That's interesting. But some great moments of beginners or some nice moments where you really feel something happening in Christopher are like he's waiting to hear a cut. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to hear the Ang Lee story that he taught me? Uh, Real quick? Yeah. It's a great trick. Yeah. He's doing, I love Ice Storm, so I got to ask, talk to him about Ice Storm once and, and he... <laughs> He was having an issue with Kevin Klein because Kevin Klein is just so ready and and professional and had a an actor response at the at the ready right. He, it was like just too planned. Mm -hmm. So he would say, "Roll camera." He would give direction, 
say roll camera, and then come up to Kevin and really lay on his accent really heavy and, and say something to him that he knew that Kevin couldn't understand. <laughs> and, um, and watch the ice storm, because you'll, you'll cut to Kevin, and like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, there's, and it's beautiful. It's like a really um, beautiful thing, so. <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, not to get too technical, but you had said that you had switched from the red to the Alexa. Yeah. The, and you, so you like that you prefer the Alexa? Well, the Alexa didn't quite exist. Uh, the so the Alexa shot. didn't exist when you shot. Yeah, when I, we were the very first red. The red. And it, was a, and it was a really bad red. It, the, the hysterical thing about the red is it's not very good with the color red um, <laughs> or pink ish. Or <clears throat> to be more specific, the basic color of like a white boy's face, you know? So it's like, oh, that's an interesting thing to build into a camera, you know. <laughs> um, so the, so I, I think obviously that camera's gotten a lot better, and the, um, but Sean and most of the DPs I work with when I do ads, or whatever, when Alexa seems to become the the camera I see most often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, in post production, do you like doing you know mixing and uh, color stuff like that? Um, the color of sound mix, you mean, in the color? Well, both the, processes, color the, correcting and, and mm -hmm. sound mixing. Color correcting, it's also, obviously, it's really hugely important, and it's essential, and it's so nice to get to do digital um, color correction where you can do, you just have more control. Yeah. Back in doing film and points is so... Did you have that experience with, with Thumb Sucker? Sucker? Yeah. 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 Um, and it just makes you marvel at people who know how to do that. Yeah. Um, and all the films, all the gorgeous films that we know. Yeah. Um, and like Gordon Willis is probably the biggest influence on me of anything. You know? Who shot the Godfather films? And More the, the Gordon Willis, um, 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 Woody Allen Manhattan. collaboration. Annie Hall. Yeah. Manhattan, Annie Hall, Stardust Memories. Yeah. Incredibly cinematic way to deal with just personal relationship films and yeah. comedy. Yeah. Um, and his whole the framing, everything about it, yeah. um, I, I just adore. Mm -hmm. So anyways, my, doing color for me, it's, it's really key, but my color is not very affected very much this film. We got to play with that um, sort of trail effect, mm -hmm. which to me is, um, I love daisies, and I just, I had to do it. Um, <laughs> so my little nod to daisies. And, um, um, but daisies, sound... Daisies the film? Or yeah, daisies the 1966 the film. So Richard Lova film. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. um, and sound, of course, is a whole recreation of your movie, and it's um, um, it's so interesting how powerful it is. Mm -hmm. um, and what I treat sound very simply and very naturalistically, yeah. but even still, like just putting the crows into the background of all the Santa Barbara stuff, if it just made it like, oh my gosh, I'm in space now. Yeah. And sound really, I think sound in film is actually space. So you'll feel the space of the room, and you'll feel the space of where you're outside. Yeah. And yeah, and that's that's very key. Mm. Last night when we were on stage, when you were introducing the film, you were saying that it's when the film is shown to the audience, that's the final, um, ob obviously. But also, it's 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 what you're, it's the whole enchilada. Right? It's the only time it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Because I do other things, or you know, I do art and graphics and other things. I guess it's the same for them, but not really. Like a film... Hundreds of people work on it mm -hmm. so hard. Yep. Like film crews work so hard. It's like so beautiful to mm -hmm. see that much human expression, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and everyone posts so many people working on it. I worked on it for five years or more. Um, all the actors, like they make themselves so vulnerable. They experience all those feelings. There's so much like dharma in a movie, yeah. right? And then it's this like little block <laughs> that does that doesn't do anything. It's not like a sculpture that still stands there, mm -hmm. you know. And it's only when you like turn on the lights and people engage with it and spend the hundred and eight minutes, whatever it is, and watch it, then it like comes mm -hmm. back to life. And that never stops tripping me out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it's was almost it. like vertigo when I think about that. It's like the Hitchcock movie or the or the physical experience. <laughs> <laughs> 
the physical experience. Because yeah. the other thing I feel as a writer, director, person is like incredibly responsible for the everyone who worked on the movie and said, that, yes, Mike, I'll follow you on this crazy road. And it's like, okay, so I got all your blood and sweat and tears and stuff. And then, but whoops, it's inert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all that yeah. heart you put into it, it's it went dead, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then it only comes back when people watch it. Yeah. But it was a it was a great response last night. Yeah, it was I mean, so sweet. It was really Yeah. You know, when it met the world, we were very proud to have it meet meet the world yeah. at the New York Film Festival. And uh thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Thank you.